Well, um, good evening. Uh, my name is Tim Dyson. I'm a demographer in the Department of International Volunteer at the NSC, and it's my uh, pleasure today to uh, introduce uh, Kevin Anderson. Um, if life has taught me anything, um, they are that people tend to deny and avoid difficult issues, and that people only tend to change their behavior when evidence of damage becomes, uh, becomes plain. Um, anyhow, um, Kevin's going to talk about a subject which I think is pretty much the most important uh, challenge that uh, humanity faces, namely the issue of global warming and, and climate change. And he's going to talk for a little bit over an hour, and then we're going to have some, have some questions from the floor. So briefly, his bio, he's, he, he, he worked for a decade um, uh, in industry, principally in the petrochemical industry, and he's currently Professor of Energy and Climate Change in the School of Mechanical, Aerospace and Civil Engineering at the University of Manchester. And he's also Deputy Director of the Tyndall Center for Climate uh, Research. Um, with his colleague, Alice Bowes, <laughs> Kevin's work on carbon budgets has been pivotal in revealing the widening gulf between political rhetoric <coughs> on climate change, political rhetoric on climate change, and the reality of rapidly escalating emissions, <coughs> very substantial escalation since the first IPCC report in 1990. <coughs> His work makes clear that there is now little chance of maintaining the rise in global temperature below 2 degrees C, despite repeated high-level statements to the contrary. <coughs> yeah, repeat, despite repeated high-level statements to the contrary. Moreover, his research demonstrates how avoiding even a four degrees Celsius rise demands a radical reframing for both the climate change agenda and the economic characterization of contemporary society. <laughs> <laughs> Look, mate, you're wrong. Go on. Oh, yeah. sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Is that it? Yeah, that's Someone it. just told me to get to it. <laughs> okay. <laughs> well, thank you very much. Um, let's just flip the side. Is it me, me doing that? Oh, it is. I'm in control now. Excellent. Right, good evening. Um, the talk today, I've called it here, Going Beyond Dangerous Climate Change. And um, the subtitle that is How Paris Locks Out Two Degrees Centigrade Rise, or at least it risks locking it out, very significantly risks it. Um, for those that, uh, that like modern forms of communication, I have a, a Twitter account, um, which I only put work things on, only engage on a work level with that. I don't, have, don't say anything about what I've had for tea or where I went rock climbing for the weekend or anything like that. It's just, just a works Twitter account. Um, and I also have a web, website. Do I need that? I'm not on, I thought I was on a... I'm just picking it up better on that. Oh, is it big? Oh, come on, blimey. Right. Um, right. And I um, also have a website where I, uh, I um, put papers and so forth uh, and also presentations. <laughs> Right, what I'm going to be going through tonight, over, I think I've been told I've got an hour, there or there, thereabouts. Bit more. Yep, well, a bit more. Um, if you can all stay awake that long. Um, I'm going to say something about Richard Feynman uh, on climate change. I'm going to make a provocation. It is a provocation, but uh, I hope maybe something that some of you will agree with, perhaps, perhaps some of you are not. Um, say something about my hypothesis and actually my conclusion right from the beginning. Uh, what was Paris, some emission pathways, a bit about two degrees C, carbon budget, budgets and some maths. Um, the role of energy demand, which is something I focus on a lot of my sort of academic career, really, and then some reflections and comments at the end. So I'm going to start off with uh, Richard Feynman, who's probably something, someone you hopefully you're all familiar with. Um, he was well, obviously very famous as a physicist, but this, this quote here is actually taken from when he was the, um, was the chair, uh, or the president rather, of the shuttle um, commission looking into the Challenger accident when the, sh when the shuttle blew up in 1986 which doesn't seem that long ago to me, but looking some of you here perhaps weren't around at the time. Um, but anyway, it wasn't that long ago. Uh, and anyway, he, he took over that, that inquiry, and this quote comes from, comes, comes from that inquiry. It's worth, anything Richard Feynman is worth reading, even an inquiry into the shuttle accident. Um, for a successful technology, reality must take precedence over public relations, for nature cannot be fooled. And I'll come back to that later, because actually I think what we have tried to do for a long time on climate change is to think that public relations is much more important than nature. Um, so I think Feynman's words should ring um, loudly in, those of, in the ears of those of us that work on climate change. My provocation is that in developing two degrees C emission scenarios, we've applied questionable assumptions, assumptions and we've fine-tuned our analysis to align with political and economic sensibilities. Now, I'm not saying that all people working on climate change have done that, but there's a particular group of 
Um, those that work between the, the, the science and the politics often referred to as modelers, integrated assessment modelers, not so much the climate modelers, but also a lot of other people who engage between the, you know, um, what the science, what the engineering is telling us, and then they engage with the policymakers or, or with the policy realm. I think we have fine-tuned our analysis to fit with what's convenient. Um, this sounds slightly flippant, but I'm going to show later that I think this is what we've been doing. Um, time travel and negative emissions are just two such examples of narratives that we have chosen that obviously are not better than reality, are, are trying to fool nature. Um, and they, 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 yet they are very important for us to maintain a pretense that we're doing something about climate change. Why have we capitulated? If we have capitulated, which I would argue we have, why have we done so? Um, in 2015 and 2016, so I should have adjusted that slide, in 2016, the carbon budgets for staying below 2 degrees centigrade um, can no longer be addressed within the dominant political and economic paradigm. So I don't, I don't think we can any longer hold to those, and I'll try to show why that is the case as I go through. <coughs> Instead, our prolonged failure on mitigation, um, prolonged and knowing failure, we've done it deliberately, um, means that 2 degrees C budgets are now a challenge to the actual framing, the political paradigm that we, in which we live, in which we operate. So no longer can we resolve climate change within that paradigm, it is now a challenge to that paradigm. And my guess at the end is that physics and the second law of thermodynamics will, will win out over our political paradigm. Not everyone may agree. Um, well, why have we capitulated? Well, collectively, I think we've been scared to voice our, um, our, our outcomes from our research. Our research points in a direction that, that is very challenging for how we live our lives, how our universities run, for the political paradigm. At every level, the analysis that we do is, is difficult. I would say, argue now that rather than um, contributing, so remember this is a provocation, so it's deliberately slightly provocative, Rather than contributing to evidence-based policy, what we've actually been doing is been developing policy-based science. Um, and I'll again sh try to show why I think that is the case. And even often when we're working very objectively in our, in our, within our boundaries, those boundaries themselves are incredibly subjective. So you can still be doing objective work in a very subjective framework, and uh, many people would argue that's, of course, what we always do. Um, we have broadly accepted that finance and economics and I do, do draw a distinction between the two, um, has trumped, trumps physics. That in the end, actually, the second law of thermodynamics is subservient to our current economic paradigm, which, again, I think we would be proved wrong on. So that's my, um, my provocation. My headline conclusion is that actually avoiding dangerous climate change, stabilisation of two degrees centigrade, if any of you, you're all familiar with that threshold. Yeah, so I'm not sure what your what backgrounds are. If any of what I'm saying isn't clear or what you all know, then just tell me to speed up or slow down. Um, so avoiding dangerous climate change is still a viable goal of the international community, just, only just. The probabilities of staying below 2 degrees cel Celsius now are incredibly slim, and I don't think there's a hope in hell of uh, holding to 1.5 degrees centigrade. Um, but we can come back to that later. I think that was a, just a ruse to keep the poor countries happy, um, which I think is, is bad in itself. Um, and I think we can do it... With, with economics, but economics in its original root. Orig e economics, and probably some of you know this much better than me, but e economics comes from the Greek, and I, I can't pronounce Greek, but oikonomia. And if you look at the definition of that, it's things like stewardship of the household, the prudent use of resources. There's no reference in the original root of economics to money. But the modern form of that that we have, of course, is crematistics, which is defined variously as the, the acquisition of wealth, the making of money. It has abstracted itself from the world within which we live. So economics, and you think of it in the classical sense, was contextual, and the modern form of economics, I prefer to see, it's finance, is non-contextual. It is unrelated to the world in which we live. It is only about wealth and money. It doesn't relate to the substance. And I think that tells us something about the, the frameworks we might have to think about for addressing climate change. The first version of that, I think, talks much more to sort of the language of regulations and standards. Now, we've made a real cock-up of those in the past, but you can have clever, thoughtful, sophisticated standards and regulations. And the second version of that, I think, appeals to what we've done continually on climate change. We've, we've relied on market-based instruments, on money markets. The emissions trading scheme, a good example. These sorts of instruments have been used to try to resolve climate change and, of course, have, again, fundamentally failed. And I think they are only, niche, only have a niche role to play um, in, in resolving the climate change challenge that we now face, because it's much more um, demanding than it was, say, 10 or 15 years ago. My hypothesis to live on 2 degrees C, and this is where it becomes quite um, political, in the sense that it has political repercussions, is that we, we need immediate and deep reductions in energy demand, 
you know, and I'll come back to as I go through the talk as to why that is the case and the scale of change that would be necessary. But the argument you get repeatedly, and given that most of my life previous to coming to university was, look, was working on issues of energy supply, mostly oil, um, the argument you normally get is surely wind, solar, nuclear, carbon capture and storage, perhaps biomass and so forth. Surely these sorts of technologies, which are, all, which are generally low carbon or low carbon-ish, can resolve the problem for us. But in 2015, it's actually it's all about timing. The thing that matters for us now is that we have, or 2016, um, we almost have no carbon budget left. So the issue now is about timing. Um, and just think what this means politically. And this is, this is, I'm working on this at the moment on some issues to do with shale gas. I'm finding some evidence to a public inquiry on shale gas. Um, for wealthy nations, the repercussion of these timings in relation to carbon budgets means there is now no space left for gas to become a transition fuel. Now that is hugely politically challenging. And lots of academics will say the opposite to that, but then you ask them, well, show me the maths that fit it with the carbon budgets, and they won't do you that, won't show you that, because it can't. Now, that means, for instance, in the UK, that shale gas development is incompatible <coughs> with the two degrees C commitments, if the UK was to play those out fairly for itself, which, of course, it's not done at all, nor has any other country, for that matter. Um, so that has, it has very big re political repercussions when you just follow through the basic logic of these suites of arguments, which I'll try to um, pull out as, um, over the next uh, wee while. Now, does Paris, given that as a backdrop, does Paris help or hinder the challenge that we're facing? Well, those of you who uh, do it, did any of you go to Paris? Oh, there's a few of you at Paris. Um, I don't mean just to Paris, I mean to the, to the cop. <laughs> Paris is a wonderful place, I highly recommend it. You can get there by train as well. Um, so, so um, this is the, the, the Paris Agreement, it's 32 pages. And uh, this is the bit of text that I'm going to focus on. I'm gonna, most of this presentation relates to issues of energy. Issues of agriculture and food and so forth are very important indeed, and deforestation and cement process emissions and so forth, all very important. But I'm going to focus uh, my, my attention tonight on energy. And to pull out that paragraph in a bit more detail, um, well, firstly, I, I should say that I do, I do think tri uh, that, that Paris was an important diplomatic triumph. I think it was hugely important. And although I am very critical of, of Paris and what came out of it, I do think that the headline um, commitment to one and a half and two degrees C, particularly two degrees C, is really important. I also think that every world leader has pretty much signed up to it, and that's basically stuck two fingers up to the sceptics. So I think there's a very strong message here that the sceptics have broadly lost the argument. Now, we'll no doubt hear them squealing in the sidelines somewhere, um, and particularly the denialists in the States. But almost everyone now is on board that the climate science is broadly right. I don't think we're at all on board as to what we have to do about it. And there's some people shaking their, shaking their heads. So not everyone's on board, but I think there's much greater buy-in to the climate science now. So what does it say? And that little paragraph I highlighted earlier. That, that um, the global community is going to hold the increase in global average temperature to well below 2 degrees C above the pre-industrial levels and to pursue 1.5 degrees C. Now, this is a global mean surface um, temperature. It also says that the um, global peaking of emissions um, should be as, as soon as possible. That's a really helpful you know, framing for your policies, as soon as possible. Um, and in fact, that, you know, the Paris Agreement is awash with that sort of woolly language. Um, and that peaking will take longer for developing countries. Uh, I don't particularly like the word developing. I'm not sure we're, we're developed over here, but industrialising countries, perhaps we should call them. Um, so they, they it will take them longer to, to reach a peak in global emissions. This was actually knocked out from the penultimate text, and quite a lot of us argued as, as loudly as we could that it should be put back in, that we should undertake um, our reductions in line with the best science. Now, we can argue what the best science is, but the idea that the word science had been removed from the text is a little concerning, but it, it was put in in the final text, fortunately. And it also says that we want to do this on the basis of equity and um, with efforts to eradicate poverty, and I think they are also really pivotal. To, to the agreement. So I think a lot of this is really very positive, even though the second lot is a, perhaps a little bit too woolly. Um, but there are some issues I have with the Paris Agreement, and some very significant issues with it. 32 pages on climate change, no reference to fossil fuels. Now, it seems ridiculous to me that you don't refer to fossil fuels in a 32-page international protocol on climate change. No reference to the word decarbonisation. Aviation and shipping are exempt that's the equivalent of emissions of Germany and, the US, Germany and the UK put together, and they are growing very rapidly, mostly because academics keep flying around the world. Um, not, not only. Uh, the, the voluntary pledges, the INDCs, um, as they're called, they equate to about 3.5 degrees C temperature rise, not the commonly voiced um, uh, number of 2.7 degrees. The 2.7 degrees temperature 
And there are lots of heroic assumptions that the academics who produced that have had to embed there, basically negative emissions. They're going to suck the CO2 out of the atmosphere in the future. Only by doing that can you actually hold to the 2.7. If you assume that those sorts of technologies don't work, then the temperature rises much more in the 3 to 4 degrees C temperature threshold. So the, the pledges we've put into Paris are far removed from what we say we're going to try to achieve. The INDCs are not going to be reviewed until 2020. That's 200 billion tonnes of carbon dioxide from now, or five years, depending on which unit of time you want to measure. Um, but you know, 200 billion tonnes of CO2 will be spewed in the atmosphere between now and when we review the INDCs that are in line with 3.5 degrees C temperature. Two and a half billion tons, sorry, 200 billion tons, of which probably 20% will be in the atmosphere changing the climate for the next 10,000 years. So we're not even prepared to re revisit this. There's a fundamental reliance in the whole of the Paris uh, Agreement on negative emission technologies, which I'm going to come back to quite a lot later on, but no reference to negative emission technologies once in the whole 32-page document, even though it fundamentally relies on those. There's a section which I'm not going to be talking about tonight, but there's, a, there's this idea of $100 billion annual per annum that would be um, to help the poorer countries, countries deal with climate change and also to, um, uh, reduce their emissions to help them mitigate as well. $100 billion. Say it fast and it sounds like a lot of money, but really it's just it's back, po back pocket change for the West. Um, the IMF, that well-known left-wing think tank, um, the International Monetary Fund, has made an estimate that in 2015 the subsidy to fossil fuels, the direct and indirect subsidy, the indirect part is very important in this, um, uh, totaled $5.3 trillion. So $5.3 trillion is with the subsidy to fossil fuels, according to the IMF. And it's the usual sort of conserv quite conservative approach the IMF have done. It's very good, very thorough, um, if you like that sort of cost-benefit analysis. But that's 53 times more than we're going to give to the poor parts of the world to deal with climate change. That shows how much we care about the poor people around the world. Um, you think, is it, it's about 1 29th, 100 billion, it's about 1 29th of the UK economy. So, you know, it's a very small sum. It's a crumb that fell off the table. And the real trick is to get us to argue about the size of that crumb rather than argue that it shouldn't be a crumb. It should be the size of a cake. It should be, you know, this should be something much more substantial. It should be measured in the trillions as to what the poor parts of the world need. Um, I've been quite critical of the Paris Agreement on, on those particular points. And I think maybe some of you may have got it. There's, a, there's some paperwork somewhere um, related to something I wrote for Nature just before Christmas in response to um, uh, Paris. Let's go back to this statement here. Um, notice it says here, well below 2 degrees C. It doesn't say a 50-50 chance of, or if you're in the UK, a 63% chance of exceeding 2 degrees centigrade. That's what UK government policy is premised on. And it's not me saying that, that's the Committee on Climate Change. The government has chosen to have a policy in the UK that they, they say relates to 2 degrees centigrade. What they mean by it is there's a 63% chance of exceeding 2 degrees centigrade. It's just lost in the small print. We're signed up to 1.5 degrees C as well in the Paris Agreement. We're going to use the best science, and equity should be driving our thoughts on this as well. So um, what's the backdrop to Paris? And then think about the latest IPCC reports that came out um, in November 2014, I think was the synthesis report. The mitigation message has changed very little in the last 25 years, in a quarter of a century. We knew everything we needed to know about climate change a quarter of a century ago to respond to climate change, which, again, looking at some of you here, probably, probably some of you weren't born, um, some of you maybe, even your parents hadn't met. Yeah. So it's a quarter of a century of doing absolutely nothing on climate change. Just think about your own lives. During your lives, if you're, if you're 25, 26, 27, we have chosen to do nothing about it, despite the fact the first IPCC report came out in 1990. So that's what people like me, grey-haired old gits at the front, that's what we're handing on to people like you, and knowingly doing so. The emissions this year, well, the emissions last year, were 60% higher than they were in 1990. So during our period of concern, our emissions have gone up by 60%. Heaven helps, but what would happen if we had no concern about climate change? And the atmospheric concentration of CO2 in the atmosphere at the moment, about 400 ppm, there or thereabouts, um, is higher than it's been for about 800,000 years. And it could be higher than it's been for about 5 million years. And we've not been on the planet, what, what how long have we been here? 300,000 years, something like that, humans? So that's about three times longer than we've been on the planet. None of us individually, but uh, as a species. <laughs> Perhaps, perhaps there's some older ones here, but not that long. Um, so that, that's, you know, that's the backdrop to Paris. That we knew, we've known everything for 25 years and we've fundamentally failed and the concentration of CO2 in the atmosphere now is way above anything it's ever been for a very long period of time. What has changed very significantly with the latest IPCC report, um, and we've been using this since 2006, so it's nice to see this now embedded in the report, 
uh, is that in terms of temperature, there's been a real recognition that it's the carbon budgets that matter. The total amount of carbon dioxide you put in the atmosphere that matters. Not some spurious nonsense about 2050, an 80% reduction or a 60% reduction. What happens in 2050 is irrelevant. I mean, think about it. We can all get a 2050 target by just before midnight in 20, 2050 or 2049, we just, before you know, New Year's Day, we just don't do anything for an hour. They, thereby, you hit a 2050 target. You know, it doesn't do anything with, do with climate change. The only thing that matters about climate change are the CO2 emissions that build up day in, day out. So having the screen on there and the projection, the lights on all upstairs and so forth, um, all of that is adding to the carbon footprint. That is all taking up our carbon budget. And that's what matters day after day. The problem with, the, that with carbon budgets is they have political repercussions because they have a time dimension. The benefit of 2050, it's not my term of office. We'll all have retired, the politicians will have left, and we'll be handing it on to someone else. So that's the reason we don't really like carbon budgets, because they don't have a nice political message with them. So let's think about all of this graphically. Um, this is just uh, carbon dioxide emissions um, and cement up the side, and years out at the bottom from 1980. That's, our, um, that's the plot of our, or an inverse plot of our concern, or a plot of carbon dioxide emissions. You could you could view it either way. So that's our carbon dioxide emissions just going up here. This is, when you think about it, this is during Rio, Kyoto Protocol, um, up here you get Copenhagen, the Rio Plus 20 summit. So you know, our emissions have just kept going up and up and up. And we have had an economic downturn. Um, whether the bankers came on board on climate change or not, I'm not sure. But um, we've had this economic downturn. And despite that, emissions have continued to rise at 2 to 3%. Um, since the economic downturn, or during the economic downturn. Now, it's true to say 2014 and 2015, it looks like the emissions actually broadly stabilised. And let's hope that's going to hold. But the, if you look at the reasons for that, as best we can understand it, they are not going to be long-term. They're short-term um, uh, response to situations, significantly uh, changing rainfall in China, and the idea that they increased their um, hydro capacity. So they had about 17% increase in their hydro production. Um, and they also had a, they had a, a cool summer and a warm winter. So it very significant, significantly affected their energy demand. Um, and it's probable that the causes of the, that of the slowdown now will not, will not persist. Let's hope they do persist. Let's hope we've reached a peak in 2016. But that, that looks incredibly unlikely. We might see it being stable for a few years, then it's very likely to go back up again. And when we think about it, it's likely to go up because we keep building things. Power stations, we build infrastructures, we build buildings like this. Remember, uh, this, is, this is quite an old building, is it? I can't really complain then. This is quite an old building. But I, mean, I, go, I go to new buildings that are like this, new lecture rooms, and they're like this, with no windows and the lights on in 2016. We invented windows years ago. But we still can't invent rooms that you can go into and actually use daylight. A radical idea. OK, maybe in the evenings it's a bit tricky. Um, so buildings, aircraft and ships, all of these things, when we construct them, they lock us in for decades. So when you build a new road, a new rail network, when you build new houses that don't meet any decent standards, when you build normal buildings, when you build an aircraft, the aircraft's going to fly for 27 years before you sell it to some African country. The same with ships as well. So we're locking, we're locking ourselves in here to very long periods of time of using high carbon infrastructure. So emissions are going to go up like this. This is with the INDC, so this is better than it would have been otherwise. Three and a half degrees, that's the sort of way we're heading. Now, the argument is, is that reasonable? Do we think we're going to keep going in that direction? Let's look at the UK. The UK claims to be a leading nation on climate change. I put a question mark here because I think you might question that nowadays. I don't think the front bench have a great deal of concern in climate change. So what is a leading nation on climate change trying to do? Well, it's given tax breaks to shale gas. Shale gas is natural gas, by and large. It's got higher, slightly higher VOCs, but it's basically just natural gas. Natural gas is CH4, which means that 75% of the mass of gas is carbon, and when you burn it, you get lots of CO2. It's basic chemistry. The Chancellor proposes 30 new gas-fired power stations, which will operate for 25 to 30 years, spewing out lots more carbon dioxide into the atmosphere. We had the highest ever investment in North Soil in 2012 and 13, and that's been cut very rapidly at the moment because of the oil price um, drop. But the idea that we invested that much money into North Sea oil, despite the fact that we have climate change, um, we're expanding aviation and ports, as they're, they're hoping to anyway. We've systematically dismantled the support for renewables in the UK, and the government has reneged on its CCS manifesto commitment. And on top of all that, we've opened a consulate in Alberta. And why have we done that? Because Alberta's next door to the tar sands, so we hope to be able to sell our oil expertise to help dig out the dirtiest fuel in the world. Um, so this is a nation that cares about climate change. So you start to think, well, is that, you know, if, are we indifferent to any other country? Norway's no better. I mean, it may look green and sound green, but they still get lots and lots of oil out the ground. Their emissions per capita are still higher than virtually any country in Europe. That's from a consumption-based perspective. 
So you know, no countries really are demonstrating what needs to be done. There are a few, perhaps, you know, Costa Rica, Cuba, Sri Lanka. They're all in the sort of sweet spot of relatively low emissions and quite high quality of life. Political problems as well, perhaps. But, um, so what about 2 degrees centigrade? Well, that's the sort of, um, the sort of reduction you would need for 2 degrees C. So a big difference between where we're heading and where we need to get to. And the argument I make is that in the short term, you can do nothing about this significantly with low carbon supply. You cannot build your way out of the problem with low carbon power stations. And you know, that needs to be tested. Is that assumption robust? And actually, I spent three days last week at Ditchley Park um, with a whole suite of people, about 40 people, who are pretty much all very strong advocates of nuclear power. And it was interesting to hear, hearing what they thought could be achieved with nuclear power. Um, and actually, it wasn't a lot. But I mean, so, so you know, th actually, that, what happened last week feeds into my thoughts on this here. Yeah, nuclear is low carbon, and I, I remain um, agnostic about nuclear power. I lived next door to it for years. My dad worked at a power station, nuclear power station, um, an old size or um, Magnox station. But it's very low carbon. Whatever you might think about nuclear power, and there are certainly lots of problems with it, and it's a, it's a tad pricey to build, um, it's very low carbon, 5 to 15 grams of carbon, of, of carbon dioxide per kilowatt hour, which is very similar to most of the renewables, and is about 5 to 10 times lower than gas with CCS and you know, probably 30 or so times lower than gas without CCS. Gas without CCS is probably around about 400 grams of carbon dioxide per kilowatt hour. So it's very low carbon. So put, let's put some nuclear in perspective. Uh, nuclear provides 11.5% of global electricity, 11.5%, which is about 2.5% of final energy demand of the energy we consume around the world, which is about um, 110,000 terawatt hours there or thereabouts. 2.5% of that um, is provided by nuclear. So when you get Monbio and Linus and Lovelock saying nuclear is the way forward, just say, do a bit of maths. There are 435 nuclear power stations that currently provide 2.5% of final energy demand. Now, if we think about climate change, remember it's a 2 degrees C, it's a timing issue. Um, then let's imagine nuclear was to provide 25% of the energy we're going to consume. Now, we still have to find the other 75% of the energy that would be zero carbon, so it's still quite a challenge. So let's suppose provide nu nuclear was to provide 25%. We'd have to build 2,500 power stations the size of Sizewell B. That's, if anyone's not aware of that, that's Britain's largest um, power station. It's a PWR um, nuclear power station and about 1.3 gigawatts. We'd have to build 2,500 of those around the globe in the next 20 or so years for it to provide 20%, 25% of energy demand. So when you look at that, and it's interesting to talk to people last week, they, th they thought that by 2050 we could possibly triple our output from nuclear. So from 25 to 7.5% set against a background of an increasing energy demand. So whatever you do, and what I'm simply saying here, you cannot build your way out of this. Now, it's not quite the same argument with um, wind turbines. It would be the same argument with, with, with um, tidal barrages. Um, and it's quite different, I think, with solar panels. I think solar panels are a bit of a game changer on some of these issues. But basically what I'm saying is you cannot construct a low carbon supply fast enough, let alone get the infrastructure in place and increase the size of the grid. We're currently constructing 70 power stations around the globe, and most of those are either delayed or over budget. So, um, so go back to this, this curve here and say that this is too early for low carbon energy supply and therefore we have to cut our demand and deeply cut our demand. But that, the problem with that again is that this has political repercussions. The supply side is really important. You know, we've, got to, we've got to move to a low carbon energy supply system as quickly as possible. And that basically means we have to electrify far more of the energy that we consume. 20% of the energy we consume is electricity. 80% of the energy we consume is not electricity. That's true for the UK, most of Europe, a bit different for France, most industrialised parts of the world, 80% of the energy we consume is not electricity. And we need to make the cars electric, the transport network electric, we need to make the heating electric, we need to make a lot more of industry electric because you can at least decarbonise electricity. It's quite hard to decarbonise the rest. So it is really important, the supply side. But this is a global analysis. And remember, we're signed up on the basis of equity. We're supposed to make our adjustments in the, in the UK, in the US, in the EU, on the basis of thinking about the poor parts of the world. So let's go back to the IPCC carbon budgets. Now, firstly, um, I'm going to take away a belief in negative emission technologies, which I will come back to. So I, don't, I'm, I'm, I think it's inappropriate to assume that we will suck the CO2 out of the atmosphere in 2050 or beyond. Now, we might succeed, but my chances of, it, of it being successful and in time are slim. So I assume that that doesn't work then one and a half degrees centigrade temperature threshold, the one, that was one of the ones we signed up to in Paris, simply is not viable. It does not fit in the current carbon budgets. We'll have blown the next, all of the 1.5 degrees C carbon budgets in about five years. So by the time we review the INDCs, there'll be no budget left according to the IPCC budgets. 
for one and a half degrees. Um, for two degrees C, the high chance of two degrees C, the 66% chance of holding to it, has gone. That budget won't survive. We're going we're to blow that budget. The 50% budget for two degrees C, um, that would require us to think of climate change like it's a war footing now. But again, Paris wasn't, didn't show any sign of that. It said we'd wait five years to review the budgets, the, the, the pledges which we know are far in excess of two degrees C. So the 50% chance of two degrees C has gone. The only one chance we have now is an outside chance, a 33% chance. Basically, you know, it's unlikely we'll hold to 2 degrees C, but there is, a, there, is a, there is an outside chance we may do. And for that, I'm not going to go into what that means particularly, but just, just to emphasise that 2 degrees C is a global mean surface temperature. It doesn't sound too bad if you come from Manchester or the Peak District where I do. It sounds quite pleasant, 2 degrees C, additional warming. But when we think about what that means, that's about 6 degrees C in the poles. Now, th this will have profound repercussions during extreme um, heat waves. It will change rainfall patterns. It will increase droughts. It will change um, uh, the, the severity and potentially the frequency of typhoons. So 2 degrees C may sound not too bad, but it actually has it is a huge t change in temperature occurring very rapidly. Um, 4 degrees C is much, obviously much, much worse. Um, but a 2 degrees C future, we should not think of it as being a safe future. Um, many people will die. They'll be poor, typically non-white, and they'll live in, the south, south, live in the southern hemisphere, and they'll be low emitters. But at 2 degrees C, many more people will die. And we know who they are. We don't know their names particularly, but we know who they are. And we know that actually the cause of that will be because people like us haven't bothered to change what it is we do. So we know, we know all of that, but we're not prepared, I would suggest, at the moment, to make any change. So what's this mean for poorer and richer nations? If we then had to translate this story of an outside chance of 2 degrees C, which is anyway dangerous for most parts, or many parts of the world, what would that actually mean for us? Well, it's a simple method here. Um, and I've got a very weak framing of equity, so it's a really weak framing of it here. The IPCC provide us with nice carbon budgets, and there's ranges on them and so forth, but let's think about those carbon budgets for, for an outside chance of 2 degrees centigrade. We could estimate what's the most ambitious sort of future could you think of for the poorer parts of the world, and we can then work in terms of energy, and then we could work out what the carbon dioxide emissions are for that. So we can do that. And then you subtract 2 from 1, and that gives you a budget that's left, and that budget is what we have to spend. And then you can say, well, what do we need to do over here? Because you can work it out from that. A simple bit of math. You don't need a fancy computer model to do this. A spreadsheet, or perhaps a pen and a calculator. Let's imagine the poor parts of the world collectively. And that, the poor parts of the world I'm using here, that, that's the old term of non-annex one, which does include China. So there's a big difference across who, who that, in, who that um, uh, covers. But actually, China dominate that sector. Let's imagine they could peak their global emissions by 2025. Now then, the, if you look in, Co in Copenhagen, uh, sorry, in, in um, at Paris, the Chinese were saying it's nearer 2030 for China, which means it would be 2035, 2040 for India, and some of the other parts of the world would be that, that long, if not later. This is saying it has to be much more challenging than that. I think that's probably viable. I think China could peak, peak its emissions by 2025 um, and still have a good quality of life in China and improving their well-being. But then you say, I want the countries, after they've achieved that, to start to reduce their carbon dioxide emissions. And that by 2035, they're reducing them at 10% every single year. 10%. That's three times faster than many economists say is possible with economic growth. We've never achieved anything like that. Even the collapse of the Soviet Union never achieved anything like that. 10% every single year. So that's massively ambitious. And then they have to have a fully decarbonised energy system for the poor parts of the world by 2050. Now, the great thing is that is really easy to work out the carbon budget for. So work out the carbon budget for that. Um, it's hugely ambitious, so there's no way the Americans would turn around and say, that's, that's too slack, too lax for the poor parts of the world. This is asking them to do a lot. But to work out the carbon budget, you take it away from the carbon budget we have for 2 degrees centigrade, and hey presto, you've got what's left for us. What's it mean for us then? And we're looking at this again at the moment, we think this number's going to be significantly increased, probably nearer to 13%. We would have to deliver, starting now, and preferably starting in 2011, about 10% reduction in our carbon dioxide emissions, carbon dioxide from energy, this is, every single year, starting now. That means about a 40% reduction in the next few years. That's about a 70% reduction by the mid-2020s. That's about a 90% reduction by 2030. And it's a fully decarbonised energy system. That means our planes, our fridges, our ships, our cars, everything that we do in energy by about 2035. If you add that budget and the poorer countries' budget together, that gives you an outside chance of 2 degrees C, which means you don't kill quite as many poor people in the southern hemisphere. So you, know, you end up with this very, sort of very uncomfortable set of maths that come out of this. 
The EU submission to Paris was that the, the, the EU and the wealthiest parts of the world would deliver a 40% reduction in emissions by 2030. 40%, that's all. And the Committee on Climate Change and the UK government said we should, it should be near 50%. You know, both of those are irrelevant, really. We should be much, if we're serious about 2 degrees C, we must be, must be near 90% by 2030. Now, how can what I'm stating here be reconciled? All I'm using here are IPCC budgets and some maths. You know, nothing complicated. So how come is it what I'm saying sounds so different to these statements? This is from the IPCC chair. To keep a good chance of staying below 2 degrees centigrade, emissions should drop by 40 to 70 uh, percent uh, globally rather, between 2010 and 2050. Um, falling to zero, now notice this. this, is a this a, you'll notice this word appears all over the place. This and the word net. And they, they hide a technology. Zero or below by 2100. So emissions will be below zero. <laughs> now that language appears all over the place now. And it's a ruse that we have managed to come up, conjure up and hide from the people that read the text. Or, or mask it just by the odd word like that thrown in. This is from the working group three. I was talking to him not very long ago about this. Mitigation costs for two degrees C will be so low that global economic growth will not be strongly, strongly affected. Well, that keeps everyone happy and chirpy, doesn't it? And the UK on this. To keep to 2 degrees C, the UK must cut its emissions by 80% by 2050, blah, blah, blah. The good news is that reductions of that size are possible without sacrificing the benefits of economic growth and rising prosperity. So if you don't say those things, remember, you won't get funded. And if you do, do say those things, you get hit on the head with the second law of thermodynamics. So you have a choice between the two. Um, so how can what I'm saying be reconciled with these, you know, have your cake and eat it, win-win, green growth type, you know, narratives. There are two rabbits in the hat that allow these two to be held together. The first one is negative emission technologies, and I'm going to focus here on BECS, which is the most common version of this. This is biomass, energy, carbon capture and storage. And this is absolutely fundamental to the Paris Agreement, and it's fundamental in, in the fifth carbon budget report from the Committee on Climate Change to the UK government, and indeed in the fourth carbon budget report as well. We grow trees and plants, and as they grow, they absorb CO2 through photosynthesis. We then convert them into pellets or whatever it might be, and we transport them all around the world to our power stations, and then we burn them in our power stations. We capture the carbon dioxide as it goes up the flue, up the chimney. We liquefy, or almost liquefy, the CO2, and then we pump it through pipes a long, long way, somewhere underground, and we store it there for a few thousand years, hoping it won't leak. So that's negative emission technologies. We're relying on that to do that post-2050. Those technologies do not exist, by the way. And the other rabbit in the hat is that we assume we have a time machine that we can peak global carbon dioxide emissions in the past, which makes the other makes the Bex look quite attractive. Um, Bex has never worked at scale. There are huge technical and economic unknowns. There's a massive efficiency penalty. A normal, car, a normal uh, thermal power station is between 35 and 55 percent efficient, constrained again by by, um, by the Carnot fuel cycle uh, um, heat cycle. Um, you add the Bex on it, that's 25 percent of your efficiency gone. Well, between 15 to 25 percent, so it makes the power stations even more inefficient. So there's a huge efficiency penalty. Um, there's limited, limited biomass availability. We also want it to grow food um, you know, for nine billion people around the planet. We also want to have aviation fuel that's going to be biomass. Ships are going to be powered by by biomass. The chemical industry expects to use biomass for its feedstock. Um, and we have to have our fingers crossed that whilst we wait for this new technology to emerge, that the feedbacks in the atmosphere won't be such that, in fact, the temperature will just keep going up, like the melting of the permafrost and the release of methane. So you have to put all of that together. And then with the peak, peaking emissions in the past, we don't have a time machine. Yeah. Now, you think I mean flippant, but I'll come back to that in a minute. The IPCC scenario database. There are roughly, well, no, not roughly, there are 400 scenarios for a 50% chance or better of 2 degrees C in that database. 86% of those scenarios include negative emission technologies. 14%, the other 14%, peak their emissions in 2010. And a very large number of those both use negative emissions and peak global emissions in 2010, which they did not peak in 2010. The UK government carbon budgets are premised on the UNEP GAP report. I heard that directly from the Committee on Climate Change and I gave a seminar there earlier last year. Um, the UNEP GAP report has 163 scenarios for 50% chance of 2 degrees C. 140 of those peak emissions in the past. 23 of them have peak emissions in 2020, but all use negative emissions. And three quarters of the scenarios that underpin the advice that the Committee on Climate Change have given the government um, are premised on both time travel and negative emissions. 
So that's what we're doing in a, an advanced industrialised nation. And I go back to Feynman here. That for successful technology, reality must take precedence over public relations, for nature cannot be fooled. And I would suggest travelling back in time, or hoping that by 2050 nothing will have happened on the climate and we can find a technology that will suck the CO2 out of the air. Um, I think both of those are trying to fool nature. And I think Feynman has a point here, just like I had a point on the shuttle. Um, and there's another paper that's around here, if you want to have a look at it, it's a commentary that I wrote in Nature Geosciences, which is about this, this duality in climate change, where actually we're, our research shows that things look very challenging, but then we managed to mask that by turning up the dial of negative emissions. So that, that should be littering around somewhere here for you to have a look at if you want to. Um, so Paris, the Committee on Climate Change, academics in general, or many academics rather, who work in this area, not in general, sorry, the UK government, etc., we'd all rather focus on, uh, rather than focus on urgent and um, deep levels of reductions today, which has massive political and economic challenges, we prefer to rely on non-existing technologies solving the problem in 2050, and at huge levels. If you look at the assumptions in the IPCC scenario database, it's roughly the equivalent of planting out one to three times the size of India. I'm not saying it has to be India, but given Britain's colonial past, that's probably what we're thinking. Um, one to three times the size of India. We have to plant it out with biomass every single year, harvest it year after year, decade after decade, whilst we suck all the CO2 out of the air. Remember, we are putting into the atmosphere this year, 36, from, from energy alone, 36 billion tonnes of carbon dioxide. You have to suck that out and store it somewhere. It's a huge quantity you'd have to do and do that with. And where are you going to store it? There's a lot of uncertainty about whether that would be vi viable or not. So let's go back to 2 degrees C, because this all sounds quite depressing so far. So I I is it still a viable goal? As I said before, my hypothesis is yes, just. Um, there are three things I'm going to touch on now, uh, and I've been saying the same things on this for quite a while, uh, but there's a bit more behind one of these now, actually. The one's on equity and behaviour, that actually only a small percentage of the population are responsible for the problem. The second one is that te technology can do a lot, but a lot of that technology needs to, needs to be thought about on the demand side rather than just focusing on the, on the supply side. And the third is that um, you know, the untouchable growth. There are alternatives to measures of a good life. Perhaps we should think about the concept of growth. Anyway, we've been forced to think about that by the, by the bankers anyway. So let's think about equity to start off with. This is according to, to uh, Chancellor and Piketty, but also the Oxfam report that came out during... Um, during COP, but the Chancellor and Piketty report that was out early in the year or paper last year, 50% of global CO2 comes from 10% of the population. And, you know, we know who they are broadly, don't we? The top 1% of US emitters, that's about 3.5 million people or so, have carbon footprints that are 2,500 times higher than the bottom 1%, about 70 million people. The top 1% of the US have carbon footprints, I think about 300 tonnes, they're about 250 to 300 tonnes per person. The global average, of course, which is skewed by people like us and by them, um, is about five tonnes per person. I think if you look at Nigeria, it's down to sort of less than one tonne per person. If you look at the UK, it's about ten tonnes per person. So just to give some sort of handle on what that is. So, you know, there's a huge discrepancy. The emissions are massively skewed to a very small percentage of the population. Who are the high emitters? Climate scientists. They're in that group because they spend most of their lives on planes, going to prototype their work elsewhere. Um, any academic who gets in the plane, and academics find, have seen this, we you know, make all sorts of arguments about cultural exchange, meet other people just like them in different parts of the world, and going to restaurants that are you know, just like the restaurants we have back here, and then claiming that cultural exchange. Anyway, um, so academics spend half their life on planes, making all sorts of spurious excuses for it. If you get on an annual flight every year, then you're almost on a long, longish haul flight, then probably you're in the high category, high emission category. I would guess that almost everyone here is in the high emission category or aspiring to be there. Um, so we're all trying to be the people that are destroying the planet, knowingly. Two degrees C mitigation is a, is a short-term challenge. It is not a long-term challenge. Um, it's about between now and 2025. And in fact, by 2025, if we haven't done a lot by then, then we'll have squandered any chance of two degrees C. It's a consumption issue, not a population issue. Population is a complete red herring in relation to two degrees C, two degrees C carbon budgets. The poor, even if you believe in trickle-down economics, and presumably no one does anymore, but um, it has never worked in the history of humankind, but let's imagine trickle-down economics actually works. The poor, the median person, will not be wealthy enough in the time frame that we have to deal with climate change for them to have high enough energy consumption for their emissions to really matter. Now, it may be true for 3 degrees C or 4 degrees C, because you have a longer time frame, because the budget's bigger. For 2 degrees C, it's about consumption by people who already consume. Now, that's not just in the West. There's 300 million people in China who consume like we consume, but that means there's a billion that don't. So, and there's some very sort of, 
Well, the thing about carbon budgets, it has a really brutal logic to it that is very uncomfortable. So I'm going to try and make you a little uncomfortable, make, me, you know, make all of us a bit uncomfortable. Let's think about aviation. I'm just using that because it's emblematic of what we see as progress in our world. You know, sorts of people like us, to, it's an important part of how we, how we uh, see value in our lives. Every tonne of CO2 from our flying, and typically those of us that fly also live in big houses, use taxis and so forth, or at least, we're, again, we're aspiring to those things. Every tonne of CO2 that the high emitters like us emit into the atmosphere is a tonne within a set carbon budget that poor people cannot emit. So, and we know for certain that in the short term, access to fossil fuels for poor people around the globe means they improve their quality of life. There's repeated work that's shown this. The common ones, the spirit level, but there's lots of academic work that's shown that when you look at the emissions, the carbon emissions go up for a while as you consume more energy. You hit a sweet spot of countries where the quality of life indicators all suggest that that's as good as it gets. And then after that, you get loads of countries like many of the European countries or the US or some of the ones in the Middle East have much higher energy consumption, but no better quality of life. When you look at all the indices that you might use for quality of life in terms of you know, health and life expectancy and um, lots of other things as well. So we know that fossil fuel use for the poor links to welfare. So every time we fly, we're telling the poor people, you can have less welfare, or you can blow the carbon budget, and then you get impacted by more climate change. It's a really nasty logic. As you get on the plane, as you fly to a conference or a family visit or a family holiday, you're, you're saying to the poor people, you can't have energy um, for your basic needs. I, if you think of a way around that, let me know, because I, I can't think of one around it at the moment. So technology, it can do a lot. So there are good things about technology here. Um, I'm going to talk about petrol cars or, or cars, normal cars and refrigerators, just touch on these, and then something about the electricity system. <coughs> just think about cars. About 12 to 15% of emissions in the US and the U EU come from, from private car use. This is often said to be intractable. We can't do much about it very rapidly. Um, and yet, when you look at it, this number is now higher, there are 300 model variants of petrol and diesel cars. These are not hybrids and these are not electric cars. These are normal cars that look like normal cars. That, that have carbon dioxide emissions that are less than 100 grams of CO2 per kilometre. And OK, you can fiddle it a bit, as one or two of the well-known German manufacturers have been trying to do. But that was on the other pollutants. It wasn't on the CO2 one, though I guess they're fiddling that one a bit as well. Um, 100 grams. The average in the UK of a car that... Well, an average car driving around here in London would probably be 170, 180 grams. The average car in the UK is about 168. The average in the st States is 212. So we're way above that. The average being sold in the UK at the moment is about 135 grams of a new car. Yet we've got all these cars here at no price premium. They still take three kids' seats in the back. They cover every category except for the sports SUV. And who drives a sports SUV except for men with small egos? So no one requires a sports SUV. So they cover every single category of car. And two-thirds of all car travel is, done, is, is traveled by cars that are under eight years old. So the natural replacement of the cars, even without a scrappage scheme, means that you would swap out the cars very quickly. And actually, about most of those miles are driven in the first uh, three years of a car. So if you had a maximum CO2 standard of, say, 100 grams and tightened that at 5% every year, this intractable sector, with no additional capital cost, just a natural replacement cycle, at reduced operating cost, you have to buy less fuel, identical infrastructure, same roads, same petrol stations, the same employment in the same companies, because the companies who produce rubbish cars also produce the efficient cars, and they're, as I say, they're slightly cheaper on average. You would have a 50 to 70% reduction in carbon dioxide emissions within 10 years in this intractable sector. Now, I'm not factoring in the rebound effect here, that people may start driving further because they, they're effectively saving money. Now, as it comes to cars and something like the UK, that seems to have stopped anyway. But that is an issue, the rebound effect. A big reduction in a short period of time. And why won't we do it? Because we're too spineless. The politicians are too scared of what the Daily Mail and, and Clarkson will say. Um, this is something we can do with existing technologies at no cost, the cars just look the same, carry the kids, yeah, nothing different about them. You can't even play with a modern car. I used to muck around with cars all the time. I was a mechanical engineer. That was my I mean, sort of pleasure when I was a kid, cars and motorbikes. But you can't do that with a modern car. So there's nothing different about these cars except for the, you know, the more efficient compared to the ones people typically buy. Refrigerators roughly the same. I'm not going to go through this now, but an A++ refrigerator, according to DEC, uses about 80% less energy than an A-rated fridge. So why sell A-rated fridges? Why say a, sell A+. And there are now A++ fridges. And there's almost no price premium. You pay more if it's got a chiller on it, a juice extractor type chiller thing, or if it's got a retro looking fridge. That's what you pay more for, not really for the actual efficiency of it. So if you phased out current refrigerators at natural replacement cycles, you're still talking about quite big reductions, 40 to 60% in 10 or so years. 
Now, you could do this appliance by appliance. You can do it by um, IT equipment. You can do it, you know, whatever you have to be looking at. You can, you can look at the best that's available at no price premium. Now, how important is this? Well, imagine you want, you keep, you want to keep your, I don't know, your, your wine cold or your lettuce chilled or whatever it happens to be. You want, you want a refrigerator. And if you have an A-rated refrigerator, it's not very efficient. So you need some electricity. You need some transmission and distribution cables. You need a power station. And you need the, uh, the Russians or the Qatarians or the Colombians to get the coal or the gas and export it over here. You put some numbers on this. You want 10 units of useful coldness to keep your fridge cold. You have to put in 50 units of useful energy in your, in your inefficient A-rated fridge. The transmission and distribution network will lose about uh, 6 to 8%, most of it in the low voltage stuff. The cables are underground, not the high voltage ones, which are very efficient. The power station is constrained by the second law of thermodynamics, so that's going to be 35 to 55% efficient. And then you can use 10% of the energy to get the stuff out of Qatar, liquefy the gas as we do in the UK. So to get the, Qatar, the gas out in, in Qatar, we liquefy it, we put it into ships, we bring it all the way over here to Milford Haven. We then have to reheat the gas to, to put it back into a gas and then put it into the gas network for the rest of us to use. And that uses up a lot of energy as well. So you look at all of that and say, well, actually, if we reduce one unit here, we save 13 units here. And yet all we focus on most of the time are power stations. So there's a huge amount we can do as consumers, as, or, or if governments put in, in, in standards and so forth. Now I'm going to just touch on growth here, the risk of being shot at LSE. Um, you know, what really matters in life Health, life expectancy, you can come up with your own list. Literacy rates, security, fairness, fun, time with your family and your friends, you know, my place, rock climbing or cycling, whatever it might be. Um, the problem with modern, well, not all economics, but the sort of economics that we tend to be dominated by now, um, and particularly the environmental version of that, of that market, neoclassical economics, is that it, it takes all these things, it takes the heterogeneous rich world in which we live, and it converts it into a homogeneous unit of pounds, but if I asked you what's the most important thing in your life, very few of you would actually say something that was to do with money. You might say it's your family. You might say it's the fun you had with your mates last year on holiday. Um, you know, it might be you, you know, your love for your partner, whatever it might be. Um, yeah, some of you might do. Some sad people might, out there might say, actually, it's my motorbike or my car, or whatever it might be. But maybe. But, um, so it, it concerns me that we, turn, can we convert all of this stuff into monetary form. And once we do that, we can substitute. Once everything has a price to it, you can substitute between your love for your family and a car park. They're substitutable. And that's, of course, is the, is the beauty of economics, of that form of economics. It allows you to be very rational in your allocation of scarce resources. But, of course, it never values things like the sunset, the things that really matter to us. Not properly, anyway. So in itself, I would argue that growth has no meaningful value. We should measure these things, if we measure them at all, in the units that are appropriate for them. But the other thing that fits in with this view on growth is that the economist's economy has stalled. When I say the economist, I'm particularly talking about this particular group of economics, the ones that we sort of, you know, all the textbooks at school, at university, still seem to be dominated by that same, same sort of marginal economics that we've been teaching for years. And it's stalled. And they can't, it's not because of carbon taxes or because of the emissions trading scheme or because of green, whatever it might be. It's stalled because it's not been able to understand its own system. It's collapsed in and of itself. And actually, if you listen to Newsnight or World Tonight on Radio 4, whatever it might be, you'll hear these economists that are dragged out every night. I don't know why, because they've all got completely different views. I mean, if you did that with physicists, it'd be like having physicists talking about an apple falling out of the tree. And one would say, well, it falls down. The other would say, it falls up. <laughs> Another one would say, it turns into an elephant. I mean, no other degree of science would, allow to, would be able to have that degree of disagreement on something so fundamental. But anyway, we keep dragging them out into news night. Um, so faced with systemic issues, I would argue that neoclassical free market economics is in complete disarray. It has no idea how to deal with these sorts of issues. It's great if you want to have you know, competing sock companies. But if you're trying to address issues that are systemic, beyond boundaries, that are globalised, I think it, it is completely inappropriate. Um, incremental approaches based on that way of thinking have fundamentally failed to live on climate change. You know, emissions trading scheme and taxes and so forth, all these things are not helped um, at all. I would argue they've actually you know, hindered on climate change at the moment. I think it may have a niche role to play in things like progressive metering tariffs and so forth. But I would argue we have a, an unprecedented opportunity to think differently. We have a blank sheet of paper, which is, uh, for academics is a great thing. We don't know how to solve these problems. We know the tools that we've got aren't up to the job. We need to be thinking quite differently. And that's quite an exciting prospect if you're an academic. Um, providing you get some funding for your blank sheet of paper. Um, so coming to the end now, I, I would suggest that if we are serious about 2 degrees C, and I'm talking about an outside chance of 2 degrees C, and let's remind ourselves 2 degrees C is not safe for many millions of people around the, around the planet. There are two phases to that. First, you need deep reductions in energy demand now, and they have, that has to be driven by high emitters. That's you know, people like us and our families and our friends and our colleagues. 
And we also need a Marshall-style plan of moving towards zero carbon energy. And I don't mean low carbon, I mean it has to be zero. You know, if it's low carbon, the temperature will just keep going up. So ultimately, we have to move towards zero carbon. And that has to be done very rapidly indeed. It has to be full penetration of that system by about 2050. All of this looks impossible. But the choice is this is impossible. I would argue three or four degrees C is impossible to live with as well. So the future is impossible. And we've deliberately got ourselves into that position. It's impossible because we have a certain mindset. And I think we have to really think very differently about what the future is going to look like. Ultimately, we have to escape the reductionist shackles that were dominant in the 20th century and phenomenally successful. As a mechanical engineer, I was taught in that reductionist way of thinking. It is very successful. It has proved very successful. It's given us the material wherewithal to live the high quality of lives that we have today. But I think it is completely in, in, inappropriate or very unhelpful often for trying to um, think about systemic challenges. And that's difficult for universities because we're split up in reductionist. I mean, the London School of LSE, economics. Why economics? Why not art? Why not engineering? Why not physics? The world's not split up like that, is it? And when we walk out of here, the world's not split up into disciplines. We've used that to construct our knowledge. And it's been very successful. But with systemic problems, you can't see the world as physics or art or economics. The world is, is what it is. It's the mush of the, that is out there. And I don't think we have any real tools within universities at the moment to think about systemic challenges. We are actually part of the problem, not part of the solution. And generally, if you're older, you're even more part of the problem because you're more locked into that particular paradigm. If we're going to solve climate change, we need leadership, courage. Leadership doesn't just mean from on high, that can mean within our own family, within our own community, within your own classroom, within your student union group, whatever it might be. Leadership, we can all be leaders in whatever group we might be within. Courage, innovative thinking, engaged teams, difficult choices. And we're going to get lots of things wrong because we don't really know what to do. And it's going to hurt. I don't like, think we should pretend this is gonna, it's not going to be win-win green growth. There'll be some of those things here and there. But by and large, if you're relatively wealthy and you have a relatively high emission footprint and they generally go hand in hand, then we are going to have to significantly and profoundly change our lives until we get low carbon energy supply in place. And that is not going to be pleasant for many of us. You know, we'll still live very comfortable, easy lives, but not as, not as frivolously um, carbon profligate as it has been more recently. So we will see changes to how we have to live our lives that will not be easy. But that's a too depressing message to finish on. So I'm going to finish on um, the quote I always use from Robert Unger, that at every level, the, the greatest obstacle to transforming the world is that we lack the clarity and imagination to conceive that it could be different. Clarity and imagination. That is exactly what universities should be about. That we should, we should have um, the imagination to think of different futures. And then we, we also need, that's not good enough in itself, we should, in universities, be thinking about clarity. How do you provide some substance to those different narratives? that can help us all understand the world that we're going to be heading towards or that we would like to actually design for ourselves. So on the upbeat note, thank you very much for listening. Okay, so Kevin's going to take uh, questions from the floor. I'm going to let him handle it. Um, no, okay. and, uh, and there's a mic, obviously, which will get to you one way or another if you've got a question. Just one at the back. Yeah. There can be questions, disagreements, discussions. I like disagreements particularly. Okay, um, well the first one, there's been some big improvements in batteries, um, but it's not the, I think a lot of time we think of, and I, I come from an engineering background, we think of the technology, we've, delivered, we've got this technology, that's going to solve the problem. The point then is how fast can you roll it out, and is the infrastructure set up for it, and then there's also the other effect, is will you get a rebound effect from it. So if we think about batteries, 20% of the energy we consume is electricity. 
So you've still got to convert the rest of the system or a significant ch chunk of it into, into something that can use electricity. Now that's not an overnight issue. Electrifying cars we can do probably reasonably quickly. Electrifying some factors of it, parts of industry reasonably quickly. Electrifying in the UK, 25 million homes of which 80% use gas. That's not going to be an instant overnight change. So you're still talking about probably a decade, two decades, even if you had a marshall style plan to make batteries, uh, you know, and I think they could help a lot with intermittency. Uh, and I also think intermittency is a much exaggerated issue as well. It's important, but it's much exaggerated. Um, so I just think we have to be quite careful with technologies, the idea that they can, we can be rolled out fast enough in line with the sorts of budgets we're talking about. I, I, they're important, but that's why my argument is that you need those as well as you need the reductions in energy demand. And the second one, I'm, I'm always very... Anyway, we've heard all sorts of things about carbon, about fuel, fossil fuel prices. You know, we've heard about peak oil, that we, you know, we keep going, prices will keep going up, it's now dropped back down again. I was at an event just recently with someone from the UAE and they're producing a dollar a barrel. Yeah. So at $10 a barrel, they're making you know, a huge profit. At $30 a barrel, they're making an even bigger profit. So yeah, I think there are lots of people around the world who can produce oil very cheaply indeed. I don't think the low price of oil is necessarily a good or a bad thing. I mean, at the moment, it's not particularly good in some respects. In the US, if you look at the car data in the US, we've seen that they, the cars have got slightly heavier since the price of oil has dropped, so their fuel economy has gone down. So, you know, we already start to see some sort of effects on this. But you know, what the long-term repercussions are of the oil price being that low, and of course, it may well go back up again. I mean, it's, not, it's, not, you know, it's down there for lots of reasons that aren't purely economic reasons. Um, so I, I'm, I'm not sure about the oil price, whether it's a good or a bad thing. Um, at the end of the day, we've got to keep, if we're serious about climate change and we don't believe in negative emissions or we don't, we're not going to rely on those, we have to keep near 90% of current known reserves in the ground. 90%. Whatever the price. Um, where's, the, where's the mic? Do you want to... Oh, um, one over there. God, I hate pick, picking them. Um, thank you. Um, I have a question slightly different. Do you think that the Paris Agreement renders the uh, Kyoto Protocol's flexible mechanisms redundant? <laughs> That's, um, I, don't, I don't know. Um, in some respects, I hope it does. Um, so probably I hope it does, because I, I don't think that they particularly help. But I mean, there may be other people here that would have a more informed view than me on that, but I, I, I'm not sure these flexible mechanisms have, I, th I think they are, uh, they are mechanisms that allow those of us who have high emissions to find ways out of actually making real changes ourselves. So I've never been a great fan of, of some of the flexible mechanisms. Um, they're just legitimized um, and national level offsets a lot of the time, which I have very little time. In fact, I think are worse than doing nothing sometimes. Um, so I, in some respects, I think I hope that they, they, they will undermine those as, as a mechanism. Ultimately, if we're serious about going about climate change at two degrees C, you know, the, the scale of the challenge is huge for everyone. No one's going to have any surplus emissions they can hand out to someone else. You know, every, every country, every sector will really be struggling to deliver this. Um, so the idea that somewhere, and this is the problem at the moment, if you look in aviation, I do quite a lot of work in aviation with other colleagues, and the aviation sector simply says it's going to buy its emissions allowance from elsewhere. The shipping sector says that as well. Now, I don't know who this person is going to be selling it all, um, you know, a pet shop in Rotherham, because um, everyone's a buyer and no one's a seller. Not, not at two degrees C. There are no sellers at two degrees C. Everyone is struggling. So um, if we're serious about climate change, the Paris ag Agreement lays out the one and a half and two degrees C, then I'm not sure what flexible mechanisms, mechanisms will have any future. Uh, one, there. One, one there and then one behind. One, one over there. Hi. Um, first of all, thanks for your refreshing honesty about this, which I think is unusual. To ask one of the most naive questions that's ever been asked at LSE, what's the best way for someone that actually cares about this? What's the best area for them to work in to try and solve these issues? Well, or at least make some small contribution to it. I don't think there is a, I don't think there is a best one. Um, yeah, I think you have to play to your individual strengths, whatever that might be. I mean, you, if, you're, if you're a wonderful mime artist, maybe that's a way to communicate it. Um, yeah. I can't see what's wrong with PowerPoint presentations, but we've been trying those for 20 odd years and that's failed. So, um, but I think there's a, I think that touches on something I've been, I've been thinking about for a while and I don't, I don't know if this is completely right yet. I'm trying to sort of talk it through with a few of my friends that work on complexity. I see climate change as a complex problem and I see our society as a complex entity. I don't just mean complicated, I mean complex in the formal sort of sense of complexity. Um, and then complex problems have emergent properties. 
And the thing about those is you can't predict where they're going to come from. So though I might think it's much more beneficial to talk to the Prime Minister than talk to a school child, actually I'm also fully aware that, I, that actually when you look at it, if you could look at it um, you know, as an emergent system, you've got no idea which one's going to drive more legitimate or more um, sustainable change. So I think this, this helps because that does also means that effectively all of us are stakeholders. We could all be the people that drive change. Some, if we all try and do things, most of the things that we do will wither and die on the vine. But the odd thing will become, will become emergent, will pop out, will, and will start to sort of stand out above other, above, above other things. And the other thing you get from complexity, you get these things called attractors, that actually other people then, like sort of moths to a flame if you like, other people will think, that's an interesting idea, and they'll pursue it. Now these things might die and wither, but some will succeed, and, and what you then forget is potential sort of catalysts for change. The great thing about that is that that gives examples to policymakers, because I don't see the world as, an up, up, as a top-down or bottom-up, it's a partnership. Then the role of policy, now that could be policy at government level or, or within, within your university, is to actually how do you, how do you nurture, how do you fertilise the good ideas that have emerged? So I think if you think of the world like that, you have, you have you know, in, in theory at least, though most of, us are, you know, most of the people in the world are struggling to make a living, but you've got seven billion uh, potential um, you know, agents of change. And if you think of it like that, well, I think it's going to be a top-down issue. I think you have a far more scope for there being um, you know, novel ways of thinking about the problems that we're trying to solve, whether that's technical, whether it's social, and they will change from culture to culture. So I, I see it like that, and therefore it plays, you go back to say, play to your own particular strengths, whatever they may be, and try and drive those changes locally, and, and ignore the fact when people tell you it's too little, it won't make any difference. Because if you think that the world's a complex problem, that's a meaningless thing to actually say. There's a great story years ago, and I just checked it recently on, online. Um, a cashier that worked at Dunn's store in, in Ireland uh, during apartheid, she just said, I'm not going to put apartheid goods through the, through the till. So she was sacked because she's only a cashier. So she got a placard and stood outside. Six weeks later, Dunn's store stopped stocking any apartheid goods. Apartheid, for those that can't remember, was during South Africa time. So, um, yeah. so that one cashier changed within a few weeks what everything, what, you know, the, 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 uh, the, the sort of makeup of that store in terms of what it, what it sold. So I think you know, there's, a sort of, there's hope in all of us to drive, to drive change. And that is, a, I mean, though my talk may be quite depressing, I think that is an up, upbeat message that we're all agents for change. Thanks for a very illuminating take on those projections. Um, so I'd like to broach a fairly unpopular topic, which is um, the livestock industry. So given that oh. emissions from livestock account for 15% of global emissions, and it's something that we can all change um, in our day-to-day -day lives, and most of us high emitters eat more meat than we need for our health. What can be done, and how can we make it such that people and governments aren't afraid to talk about it? It seems to me that you know we can talk to each other, and, and um, people can say that you should stop driving and start taking the train, but you can't say you should eat less meat. Well, I think you can say it. You've just said it. I think we should be saying those sorts of things. <laughs> um, and I, th I actually don't think it's such an unattractive message now. I mean, firstly, it has a health dimension to it, which. You know, people seem to be much more interested in, in their own individual health than they are in the interest of the, in the health of the planet. Um, so there is a health dimension to it. But I, 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 I accept everything you're saying. It's a hugely important subject. People need to be addressing, uh, addressing it. I think it has been a bit of a Cinderella issue until quite recently. But I think now more people are thinking about issues of, of um, meat consumption. Um, I, what I find, one of the things, I, it's not an area I work on, but one of the things I have seen is, is that if you look at China, you see China sort of following a sort of a Western model in terms of just consuming more and more meat. If you look at India, despite the fact it's, very, it's growing also at a very similar rate, um, you don't see that. So there are very strong cultural dimensions to, to why, is people, why can't communities do or do not eat as much meat. Um, and obviously then, then there's also the other side of it, you know, the PR side of it, and, the, and what, what's pushed by companies and so forth. But very clearly, we can, I'm a vegetarian, um, I say that, I should, should point out, I do eat some fish, if it's marine stewards, it counts all ticked, so I don't eat, 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 much, eat much fish, unfortunately. Um, but I, I've, I've been vegetarian since 1987, um, I'm reasonably healthy, I've got rock climbing and so forth, it seems to work pretty well. So, yeah, I, yeah I'm, I'm, it's just an anecdote, that, isn't it? But I don't think, it, we can live healthy lifestyles and not have to eat a lot of meat. So, clearly it's easy to do, um, how you go about driving that sort of change. Yeah. I work on energy, so it's not really my, my area, but I, I, I take the point that, that meat is hugely important. Not just meat, actually, the, the types of diets we have, because rice, is, rice can be really problematic. You know, rice can have a lot of uh, methane emissions. Um, transporting goods around the world can have quite a lot of methane emissions, and sometimes even local goods can. The use of fertilizer is a real problem um, in terms of greenhouse gas emissions. So the whole process of, of, meat, of, of agriculture is something we need to focus on in much more detail, and it's much more complicated than, than, than the energy side. 
because the issues are much more difficult to understand and you, don't, you can't replicate things so, e so um, easily. Um, one bomb back there. Um, thanks very much for really bringing the issue back to individual responsibility because uh, it seems to me that um, I'm glad you mentioned that Irish case because I'm from Ireland although I'm based in London now it was very interesting that, that when that girl did that was a very controversial thing at the time mm. and a, a, about eight other workers were fired as well and they all yeah. camped out so you quite heroic figures in South Africa but at the time, it was amazing because the entire business community were obviously in favour of doing business with South Africa, uh, even the richest of, of the, in society. And it was very interesting that after apartheid, they were celebrated by everybody, <laughs> even the very people who fired them. <laughs> no, but I mean, to, to get back to the to key question, what I put it to you really is that it's obvious that given the way the planet works and that universities really, I've come to the conclusion, are really designed to tame our sense of outrage, to make us compliant citizens who join the establishment and tell everybody to keep calm while we work out the solution. But as we can see, it's not going to work. I mean, you've made the point there, but what is it, 3.5? We're heading towards 3.5 under the automatic pledges. We really have five years, but we're not going to review that five years until the five years is up, when 200 billion in emissions have already been done and there's nothing really happening. So I put it to you really, isn't there a big responsibility on, on people who know about this to express outrage, to yeah. come out and tell people the truth for the university to be much more forthright and academics and scientists to really tell people what's really happening and not to remain silent? You know, it seems to me that they just don't want to upset the politicians in case they, they upset the public. Because I genuinely believe if people really knew the consequences, they would be much more receptive. But people do not know. And I myself, I have to admit, and I, I consider myself to be a well-informed person on a lot of things. <coughs> but uh, it was only the COP21 really alarmed me because I finally got engaged with climate change in a big way. And I admit, I have changed my diet, but that change has been very much linked to the whole issue of, of, of climate, I have to be honest. I mean, I think it is alarming. But what's even more alarming, and I'll stop now, I know I've gone on a bit, is that the people, you're unusual, like you're prepared to be a little more radical. But the point is, why are scientists, why are the universities so irresponsible? Why are they failing in their duty? I mean, I, I have a lot of answers to that question, I admit. But really, it's, it's a, it's, it's, but it is, it is, it is, I mean, it, it, surely it betrays the whole nature of the institution. Now, of course, as I'm very active in human rights, I mean, I could point the finger at the LSE on the whole question of China, but I'm not going to. But, the, the, you know, I certainly, and I've, course, I have great Chinese friends, so I don't want to get too political. And, of course, we mentioned apartheid, for example. We know about the situation in Israel, but I, I'm not going to go off the point. But what I'm really saying is, when those in society who have a role of leadership, who know what's going yeah. on, they just remain silent, yeah. keep calm, but we're out of that situation. And why aren't scientists, why aren't universities, I, I'm repeating myself now, so I'm going to stop doing, yeah. fulfilling um, the real responsibility. Thank you very much. I, mean, I, I have to say, <laughs> I, I agree with a lot of what you said, and, and in fact I've been criticised, um, yeah, maybe reasonably, by quite a few people, because I've actually said, I think one of the papers I've put up there, is that, that the scientific community, as in the, those who work on climate science, we are self-censoring. And, and I hear this repeatedly from colleagues, and I normally do it over uh, up for a pint to a glass of glass of claret, but you know, uh, uh, the, uh, in the pub somewhere, away from a microphone, they'll say things they would never dream of saying um, in public. And I think that is a real, you know, it's a, it's a sad state of affairs when those of us who come to university, the, the one role I see, I was actually asked that today, what, what do I think was the role of us as academics? And we were, to me, it's two parts to that. The first is you do your research carefully, you're going to get it wrong from time to time, so a bit of humility, you will get it wrong, but you do your ca research carefully. And second, you commu communicate it clearly, directly, and vociferously. And if it's misused, you, you, know, you, you point out how it's been misused. And they're the only two roles. Whether people like it or don't like it is irrelevant. It's only whether they disagree with the conclusions that matters, not whether they like the conclusions. Um, whether it's politically acceptable or not, irrelevant. Yeah. It's just to do our research and communicate it clearly. And actually, I'm really concerned about a lot of people working on climate change is that they will say things quietly away from microphones they would not say publicly. And there are lots of reasons for that. Firstly, we're humans. We don't like the idea that what we're doing is destroying the life of our own, ch of our own children. And a lot of us are actually knowingly doing that. We don't like the idea that actually, if we want to be successful in universities, it means you have to have all these international connections. And anyway, we like, we like to fly around the world. So we like to fly around the world. We like to pursue that sort of activity. So we, want to, we also want that to be fostered in our PhD researchers and so forth. Um, our research councils, 
um, are all now bought in. They're not, no longer an arm's length from government. They're hardly a you know, toenail from government. Um, you know, so they're, they're basically just bought into the idea that whatever research we do has to feed into the growth agenda of George Osborne. That is, no, that is not the role of the research councils. The role of the research councils is to fund good research, regardless of whether it feeds into a growth agenda or not. Um, so I think almost at every level, whether it's personal, whether it's structural, whether it's our own colleagues around us, there's a, there's a, um, a pressure uh, not to rock the boat. Um, and I think that is a real problem. And the university is a place where we should rock the boat. But the students don't either. I mean, you know, it just, and maybe it's just, we hear this all the time, so maybe it's completely wrong. It would be interesting to do some, you know, some numerical analysis to see whether it actually has statistical analysis to see whether it has changed. But when I was younger, it just seemed to me that there were a lot more student bodies um, prepared to stand up for whatever the issues might be, whether we agree with them or not. Now it seems they're much more pliant. They're much more, you know, um, you know they're, perhaps they're good, they're there to do their studies and leave at the end. But they don't seem to be acting as much as they used to to drive, to drive um, new agendas, even with our own, within, our, within our own institutions. Um, I, don't, I mean, I don't, some of you here, I'm guessing, are, are students and researchers in the university here. I mean, is there a strong student body here driving change within the LSE or, or not? It's, it's a, say again? There's a divestment movement. Yeah. Yeah, good, yeah. But just, just say, I, I've been involved in the student divestment movement in Manchester. And, it's, and there's some really good you know, people there who are really driving things forward, but there are like about half a dozen of them in the biggest university in Europe. I think it's the biggest university. They're certainly the top one or two. Um, and you get half a dozen you know, students there driving the divestment campaign. You know, where are the other 5,000 students that should be supporting them? So I think right across the board, whether it's the academics, whether it's the students at the moment, we've all seen pretty apathetic. Um, got one down here. And then I should try and get some in the middle. <laughs> Thank you. Um, you quoted the research that says that um, access to fossil fuel energy increases the quality of life. Yeah. Um, has there been similar findings uh, in relation to uh, renewable energy as well? Have people looked into, you know, hydrofuel or solar energy or something yeah. like that as well? Yeah, in fact, that, as, as I understand it, that research just shows it's access to energy. And in the short term, the, the main access to energy will be through fossil fuels. Now, we could be using, should be reusing renewables wherever we reasonably can. But if you're going to try and increase the level of access to fossil fuels, uh, access to energy for some of these people, fossil fuels will be part of that footprint in the early days, you know, as much renewables as possible. Um, but it's, it's access to energy, not particularly fossil fuels. I mean, the problem with fossil fuels, they also call, cause local health pollution issues if you've got a diesel generator or whatever it might be. Um, but that research has been repeated time and time again. It's not, you know, it's, it's not just the spirit level. There's, there's repeated research that shows that. And, it, and there's a very clear sweet spot of countries that have relatively low emissions, not in line with 2 degrees C, but they are countries that you wouldn't normally, you know, you, they're, not the they're, not, they're not the usual suspects. They are the sort of Costa Ricas and the Sri Lankas of this world. And there's about, I think there's about two dozen countries there, so 24 countries, of which about 12 are passing through it by the looks of it. They look like we're on a trajectory heading out towards more where we are, you know, high emissions and no improvement in quality of life. And the others look like they're more sort of stuck in that particular group. But it's not my area of research, it's other people's stuff that I'm relying on, on there. Um, one here, and then one there, and then one there. If you were talking to the Prime Minister, how would you persuade him to change course? <laughs> That's the, the old lift question. Um, <laughs> I mean, I... I think, and this could be the wrong way of going about this, and there, we were discussing this briefly earlier, actually. I think I'd probably uh, um, try to go via his children. So that's, <laughs> that's the... Re I'll try to say... You know, uh, well, two. One is his children, and the second is his legacy. I mean, I have no, no chuck with the Prime Minister, you know, even less of the Chancellor. Nevertheless, I think what is interesting about the Prime Minister, this particular Prime Minister, is that when it came to, to gay marriage, for instance, there, was, there were no wins for him in the Conservative Party in doing that. Um, and yet he was prepared to stand up on a basis of on, a, on, a, on a point of principle. So I think you know, he, he, there is a principle bone in him somewhere. You may have to dig quite deep to find it. You have to dig a lot deeper in, in the Chancellor, I think. But uh, um, <laughs> that's probably very unfair. I'll, just, I'll retract that. Um, it's just, uh, but, so I think, I think you'd have, so I would play to both his legacy and I'd play to his children. They'd be the two things I'd try to use to help him understand the, the importance of addressing issues of climate change. Um, with, the, with the current Prime Minister. I think you'd have to take it you know, person by person as to what approach you would take. Um, one there, there was someone else, and then one here. So, oh, this one here, whilst you've got the mic there, sorry, do that one. Hi there, hi. Um, I'm, I'm just a member of the public here, but um, I'm obviously surrounded by these LSA students, some of the uh, finest young minds of our generation. So, <laughs> with, with that in mind, what's 
you earlier on you touched upon sort of politicians being somewhat cowardly and probably not doing their duty here. I'm probably surrounded here by some of the future politicians of the next generation. So what's your advice to them? How are they going to sell this to, for example, not an audience full of academics like this, but maybe a, a poorer working class sort of audience, maybe in Glasgow or Middlesbrough, yeah. and explain to them why they need to sort of cut down on their lifestyle yeah. just, to fund this, uh, just to fund this science? Okay, well, t uh, two things there. Um, well, three things, possibly. Um, the one thing I think about, you know, I, I, I think that we should aim to be consistent, internally consistent in our arguments. This is what I object to in politics, is that they say we're going to do one thing on one hand, so they're going to aim for two degrees C or one and a half degrees C, then they put in policies like more shale gas, extend North Sea oil, you know, which are completely counter to it. Now, th th to me, that's wrong. And actually, the public know it's wrong. The public can see through that most of the time. Um, the second thing, don't be taken in by the fact is I'm not sort of LSE here. Um, I work in a university. I, I spent years working in the oil industry. Um, people are no cleverer in universities than they are in in construction yards. They're more eloquent, they have longer words and more syllables, but yeah, they're not any cleverer, they just, just, just sound more eloquent. Um, so I think there are clever people all over the place, in the LSE and outside it. Um, and your final point about the, the, the you know, how do you sell this to other people? Firstly, I don't think we should be saying to people who live in Middlesbrough or Darlington or wherever it might be, that they should be reducing their quality of life. I, I want to see the emissions of a lot of people who are in fuel poverty in Darlington and Middlesbrough, I want to see their emissions going up. And that's why I want Tim's and my emissions to come down. So we compensate for the poor people in the UK. There are 25 million ho households in the UK. Between three and a half and five million of those households are in fuel poverty. Their emissions should go up in the short term, not go down. Because that means they're having a better quality of life. Their children have less bronchial problems. Um, but that means those of us that emit a lot of carbon dioxide have to cut back on our carbon dioxide even further. Um, so I do not want to try and sell it to poor people. They should be doing more. They should be, making, you know, they should be kicking the ass of people like me so that, that people like me do a lot more but it shouldn't be required of them. Now, in the medium term, they will also have to make some changes, but I, hopefully that will be more structural. So I know that in, if you're looking at Middlesbrough or Darlington or indeed Manchester, they'll be living in crap houses that have really low quality to them. So those, the government should be introducing a retrofit agenda to improve the quality of houses like those. We spent £375 billion on, on quantitative easing. £375 billion. We just handed it to the banks. That's a stupid idea that was, but anyway. Um, yeah, that money would have retrofitted almost all of the properties in the UK. Well, it would have retrofitted all the properties that are in fuel poverty and a lot more. That would make them, you know, n that would almost eliminate fuel poverty and it would pretty make, make most of those properties resilient to a changing climate as well. So there are plenty of things that, that a, a moderately astute politician could think through, but they have to think quite differently. Okay, um, question there, and then, so I'm probably pointing out various ones, and then. And then one over there, so I'm just trying to get a better, slightly better gender split on them. <laughs> Hello, so I'm thinking of writing an article about uh, all of climate change stuff. I want some descriptions of the effects of 3C or 4C just to set the scene. Now, there's IPCC reports, which are uh, valuable, weighty things that say we have high confidence of medium effects of some foods in some part of the world yeah. um, at some point in the future. And there's... Um, a book that I think called The Path to Six Degrees that has a chapter on each one. Um, but he's not a scientist, may have taken some liberties. So I just wanted to ask you if there's uh, any resources you would suggest along those lines. And it was a bit of a problem actually as the temperature starts to go up because there's not been a lot of research done on it because we all assume we're going to hold a two degrees C. But actually it's only more recently people start to look at what, the, the, what would the impacts look like at these higher temperatures. Um, I think the book you're talking about, was it Mark Linus's book? It might be Mike Linus, but yeah, um, I wouldn't necessarily rely on that. Um, but I mean, not. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> well, I, I, had to, I disagree with Mike Linus and his views on nuclear power. But anyway, um, uh, the Hadley Centre and the Foreign and Commonwealth Office, the Hadley Centre based at the Met Office, who did a lot of the climate modelling in the UK, they did some work a few years ago that looked at four degrees C. Um, around the globe. Now, it might be worth talking to the people who did that sort of work. Now, the, the outputs from their analysis, but I say it was a, quite a few years ago, and a, a lot's changed since, in our understanding since then, was that four degrees C as a global average. You would see in heat waves in Europe, you see about eight degrees C signal on top of that. So imagine the 2003 heat wave, where 20 to 30,000 people died in Europe. You'd see eight degrees extra warming on top of that, and it would be, could be prolonged. Um, in, the, in, the, um, in China, it's about 6 degrees C additional warming, and in the North America, it's nearer sort of 10 to 12 degrees C warming. So a 4 degrees C temperature rise sees that sort of level of changes in the extremes. It's also saw a 40% reduction in the food production in staple crops in the southern hemisphere. Um, so the, and, and about meter sea level rise, I think, by the end of the century. So the, that work between the Hadley Centre and the FCO, it might be worth chasing that up. 
Try Simon Sharp at the FCO. He might be able to point you to where it is or if any new work has been done. But one of the problems with 4 degrees C is not a lot of research has been done to say what would that look like in terms of um, you know, changes around the planet. One of the things we do know is that uh, you get huge changes in rainfall and we're really rubbish at, at predicting that. Models can tell you all sorts, but I wouldn't believe what they say about where the rainfall is going to be. Um, you can tell us a bit more about the temperature, but less about the rainfall, at, at these higher temperatures anyway. Um, down here, late lady there. Don't you think you're underestimating how much aviation has increased people's quality of lives? Like working class people who do very, very tough, mm. gruelling jobs all year round, the highlight of their year often, I don't know, I don't mean to sound condescending, but it is to go on a holiday to the sun. Yeah, um, <laughs> my, best, my best mate is one of those. Um, I, I, don't, I don't fit very comfortably into universities. My best friend is a, is a mate who owns a chip shop, and that's what he does. Uh, I have no problems with him doing that. I have problems with the fact is that aviation is not driven by people like him or the poor. The numbers are really clear. Aviation is driven by the wealthy flying lots. And aviation is growth is driven by the wealthy flying lots. And we keep trying to say it's the poor flying at Tori Molinas. You know, the data just doesn't support that. You just look at the, just look at the incomes and look at the postcodes of the people that are flying. You know, they come from the wealthy parts of our, our society. There are, there are poor people flying as well, but they are not the drivers of the, growth, of the significant growth. It's, it is the wealthy flying lots. Um, now, that is even true as far as I can understand it in other parts of the world, because obviously lots of Turkish people are flying. Someone was talking about that recently with me, or Chinese people are flying. But generally, they're the wealthy people within their society that are flying. So you know, a lot has been gained from aviation, but it, not, you know, not everything. It also allows us to drop bombs on people, so there's another bad side of it. But <laughs> um, one here, uh, I'm not very good, and, and then one there, and then one there. As an uh, engineer, what is your view on the potential and the feasibility of geoengineering for this okay. problem? Are you all familiar with what geoengineering is? No, okay. There's this term, term called geoengineering, and there are generally seen to be two aspects to it. You correct me if I think I've got this wrong. Um, one of them is solar radiation management, SRM. Sounds lovely. Solar radiation management. Just flips off the tongue, doesn't it? And what, by that, we're going to reflect sunlight back out into space. So we reduce the amount of warming that lands on the planet. And there are various routes for doing that. So one of the most common ones that's been discussed at the moment is to fire rockets or something similar into the stratosphere, the area of the atmosphere we don't fully understand, um, either dynamically or chemically. And then you're going to put sulfate particles into the stratosphere. And these sulfate particles reflect some sunlight back out into space. And therefore, you reduce the amount of uh, wattage that comes onto the planet. You reduce the amount of warmth on the planet. So you're going <laughs> to, rather than switch the lights off or design windows in our lecturing theatres, we're going to fire rockets into the stratosphere with sulfates, which will gradually migrate out to the poles. Heaven knows what happens when they get there. Um, we don't know what the implications of this, of course, would be around the globe. But... You know, it's better than making some decent mitigation policies, apparently. The other option, you might also, therefore, another option would be on SRM, which is much less damaging, is if you evaporate surf some surface seawater, then you get more um, salt particles in the atmosphere, which act as cloud condensation nuclei, which means clouds can form on them, and then clouds can, depends where the clouds are and the height of the clouds and so forth, but clouds can reflect some sunlight back out into space. They can also hold some of the Earth's heat in. So you have these issues about that. So that's another one you can look at. You can, cr you can plant certain types of crops that are, um, that are um, more reflective than other types of crops. So you, you, can, you can change the, sort of the, the particular species or, or the um, type of crop that you're growing for food reasons. Um, so there are suites of these techniques that you can use for the solar radiation management. But the problem with that is it's actually, I always say it's like a sticking plaster on gangrene. You put the plaster over it and the CO2 emissions keep going up underneath. So you would, you would use that. I would guess we would use that as an excuse not to do mitigation. We'd also possibly use it in certain areas to protect things that we're interested in, but they would never be the poor people, of course, the ones who haven't caused the problem. So I think there are, there are lots of problems with it, with solar radiation management. The other thing, if you switched it off, say there was a war and you could no longer fire rockets in the stratosphere or some instability and you weren't doing it, you might get a spike if the, in temperature if the carbon dioxide emissions have been going up underneath it. And also the carbon dioxide emissions may still go up and that would increase the acidity of the surface oceans, which may well affect food and production in the oceans. So solar radiation management may have niche roles to play, say, if you could actually use it like this, to protect particular ecosystems. So you might put it in some parts of the world to try and do that. But control it to that, controlling it to that level, we're way away from that sort of at the moment. The other technique is to use, um, is to remo remove the CO2 from the atmosphere. So it's, it's sucking the carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere. That actually, you know, it's tackling the, the, the problem head on. 
Um, the problem with that is at the moment is one of the ones is this BEX technique, but that requires just huge quantities of the, of the land put, us, put over for that, and it's very uncertain it would work, um, and it's a long way away to be, able to, be able to be able to do it. But that's the problem with a lot of the technologies. They're still quite a long way away. So there are quite a few technologies that you can, you can use energy um, and various catalysts to extract CO2 from the atmosphere. You see these things about these trees that will suck CO2 onto filter plates. You then, of course, got to dispose of it. Disposing of a huge quantity of CO2 is not without its problems. We don't know how to do that at the moment. We don't know if there's sufficient reserves around the globe for us to put it there securely. Um, and you require lots of energy. And you, people say, well, it's okay, we'd use renewable energy. Well, if you had renewable energy, we wouldn't have to burn fossil fuels. So we wouldn't have such a problem anyway. So you know, it seems odd to me to use renewable energy to try and capture CO2 from the air when you could be using renew renewable energy to keep the CO2 in the ground by not burning the fossil fuels. So geoengineering... I, I, my personal view is we should be researching it, but we should always assume it does not work. The problem is that by saying that, I also realise it's slightly naive and that as soon as you start to research it, people will rely on it because the alternative is you have to have you know, significant political and economic repercussions. And most of us are, are reluctant to do that or accept that sort of change. Um, but I think the genie is already... Be, well, at least the, the you know, Pandora's box is open. People already think that geoengineering is one option we should consider and therefore I think we should be researching it but with a very strong assumption that it will not work. Um, question here. And then did you have a question over there? No, no. Oh, one here then. So one, two, three. Four more questions. Okay. All right. Four more questions I've been told. Does that include these ones? Yep. No. no well, well, I'd like to say yes, but I think we've got to okay. keep an eye on the yeah. yeah, fine. Hi, Kevin. Um, you alluded to solar technologies being something of a, a hmm. game changer. I was wondering if you could elaborate on that perspective. Okay, um, I don't work directly on solar. I have colleagues that do work on it. What's interesting, I, th I think, although we're now starting to hear a few people said, oh, I, I predicted this was going to happen. No one predicted what was going to happen in solar, from what I could see. Yeah, the, the drop in the price, um, and also the efficiency improvements. They're running, I think they're running about 20, 21% efficient. Any solar experts here? Something like that, aren't they? So 20, 21% efficient. They're easy to install. They're incredibly cheap now. They, I mean, they look like they're getting to the point, depends what discount rate you use, they look like they're getting to the point where they, you could actually be cheaper than gas-fired power generation. Now, they don't, obviously, they don't, fire all, they, don't, they don't run all the time, so they need to run with things like batteries and so forth, potentially. Um, but also, it's already changing people's habits. So it's not just the solar panel, I think, it's actually that matters. It's how it changes how we do things. So I, I was talking with people this afternoon at work, and these, they're, they're interviewing families who are changing how they're using the appliances in their house to match their production of energy from their solar panels. So it changes those sorts of time frames. So I think the social change from solar panels is about as important as the panels themselves. If you can't afford the panels, then just put a, a blank one on your roof and you probably think you're doing some good and you'll change your behaviour accordingly. So I, think that, um, so I think solar panels could be a game changer, not just in parts of the world like here, but particularly areas where there's no grid. You know, we always assume that the rest of the world is like us. Most of the world does not have a grid. And solar panels can be very, very effective there. And allied with batteries can provide a fairly reliable energy source. So I think, that they, think they have a real... You know, photovoltaics have now have a real potential to significantly improve the quality of lives of many of the poor people in the world and reduce emissions in somewhere like the UK. And there's one quick thing. DEC, DEC have a, um, an energy, a, a emission pathway tool, an energy pathway tool. It's really, it's really good um, on their website. It's got a lot of detail behind it. If you play on the energy pathway tool and then use what's called DEC Level 4 for solar then you can generate, according, according to their analysis, um, from all the southwest facing homes in the UK, only the southwest facing homes, you can generate 100 terawatt hours of electricity every year in the UK. 100 terawatt hours in a country like the UK. That's one third of the UK's electricity demand from, from, pa from panels that are only on the southwest facing roofs. And the deck analysis assumes old panels that were 16% efficient. So it just shows that even in a country like the UK, you could generate huge quantities of um, two energy. Quick okay, two quick questions. Uh, one here has had his hand up for a long time, and then one at the back. Anyway, any, has anyone else had their hand up for a long time? No, not one here. Uh, thanks again for a really nice talk. You, I'm quite pessimistic, uh, more yeah. than you, more than you, and I saw. Therefore, my question: There are tipping points in the yeah. climate, and what do you think are the most likely ones that we can hit, <sighs> and what is the likelihood that we might hit them? I've got a good voice. Well, we, some people would argue, people like Jim Hansen would make very cogent arguments that we've already passed the tipping point for some of them, but we just haven't quite seen it occurring fully yet. I, th I, mean, I think the permafrost has to be one of the most significant ones, um, and we're already starting to see that um, occurring. Is it one, is it the one, I should know this number, is it the one-third or two-thirds of Russia is in permafrost? 
Um, and that if that starts to melt, as we are already seeing in some parts of Russia, then you get massive releases of methane and, you, and lots of other structural problems as well. But it also means they've got better access for agriculture because you can grow things there. But I think the methane emissions from, from, from permafrost could be a huge problem. And th now, there are different estimates of that, but some of the estimates I've seen from some of the colleagues I've uh, some generally more respect for are saying it's probably 20 to 30 percent of our carbon budget that would be taken up by methane. But I think they're talking about a bigger carbon budget than I would be suggesting. So I think probably it would be you know, a very significant chunk of our current carbon budget would be taken up by that sort of feedback. And I think that's the most likely one to occur in the short to medium term. Um, Will it occur in the 3.5 oh, I think, well, I think it way, it's already occurring now. Yeah. I think, I think the, the one problem with these feedbacks, these tipping points, where the, where, where the natural process starts to put, put more greenhouse gases in the atmosphere, is that the higher the temperature goes, the higher the probability is that they're going to occur. Now, any reasoned person who is conducting that experiment on their own lives or their own planet would say that you should avoid, therefore, those high temperatures. But we're not very reasoned. So we're prepared to carry out those experiments on planet Earth as if we've got another planet just over there in case ours got, the experiment goes wrong. You know, it, there is nothing that explains why it is that we're doing what we're doing. We're not precautionary at all when it comes to these feedback issues. Um, there's a question. Yeah, hi there, I've been asked to be really quick. Um, you've mentioned obviously your disdain to obviously, uh, you know, your lifestyle in terms of sort of traveling. Yeah. Uh, and also you've mentioned you're vegetarian as well. Uh, but what have you actually implemented since you've been lecturing, um, which has really made a change and an impact on sort of your tonnage of output of CO2? I mean, we've all heard or watched Al Gore's Inconvenient Truth and you find out later on that he's got yeah. you know, a 20 bedroom house with the lights ablaze, so yeah. lead the way, please. Um, right, <laughs> I, I'm never sure whether I should talk about what you do yourself. I, I haven't flown for 11 years, um, so that, that's my biggest, that's the most, for most uh, high emitters, not flying is probably the, the thing, not just the static signal, but the dynamic signal, because you're actually, you're, you're saying, you know, if you fly, you're saying build more airports, and that's why the Chinese are building 150 new international airports. So flying is the, is the one that I've cut back on, and that's not been easy. Um, I'm, not, I'm not worried about it from an academic point of view, but I have an uncle in Australia who's not very well, and I'll never see him again, so he's going to die without me ever seeing him. That's not easy. So flying was a big one. Um, I moved into a smaller, I moved from a house, a moderate-sized terrace house, into a flat. It's a very lovely flat, so don't feel sorry for me. It's a very beautiful flat in an old manor house, but it's much smaller um, in terms of the total area and the number of rooms I've got than the last place I was. My bills are, um, my total energy bill is about 300 pounds a year. So, pretty low. What are yours, Tim? <laughs> <laughs> um, so, my total, and I only have one house, and um, I drive an old camper van, but I've, I've cut my mileage by about two thirds um, in the last 10 years. So, I've made some efforts for myself, but uh, my emissions are still far too high. They're probably lower than most professors, but they're still far, far too high on a global sort of scale. Um, but there are lots of things that we can do in our own lives, and we can try and drive that elsewhere. There's been quite a movement now amongst quite a few academics about trying to cut back on their flying. And that's not just in this country, but elsewhere. So there's the, you can sort of see how it mobilizes a sort of, you know, a change in, in people's mindset and thinking that it's possible elsewhere. If you see someone else doing something, you think it's possible. So it's very helpful, I think, once people start to drive changes in their own lives to, to, you know, to talk about it amongst your colleagues and your friends. Well, I, I don't think I have to say uh, a, a, any more. Uh, two, well, one or two points. Firstly, we, the organizers want us to leave from that door and that door. Um, second point I'd make is that I met Kevin for the first time about five years ago in Shanghai. Of course, I flew there, but he went by train. Um, uh, uh, three, and back again, yeah. Uh, th uh, three other points. Uh, I mean, God, there was so much that was of interest there. Uh, the first is the intimation in some of what he said about essentially uh, contraction and convergence, reductions by richer people and uh, increases by poorer people. I thought that was absolutely key. Secondly, the way in which he's highlighted this thing, completely new to me, the way in which we're all bloody well relying upon BECs in terms of the future. That strikes me as being unbelievably important. And a third thing that I completely agree with him as a demographer, and that is the bankruptcy of a hell of a lot of the discipline, I won't use the word science, that is modern economics. Um, well, personally, Kevin, I'd like you to come back and give this talk uh, every week, but I, I would ask uh, um, everyone present to show their appreciation for, for the talk. <laughs> <laughs>